is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Crazy Ex Girlfriend, Season 1, Episode 7. I'm so happy that Josh is so happy. In this episode, Rebecca, spoiler alert, is not so happy. Valencia continues to be the worst. But also, like, don't buy surprise furniture, y'all. Just don't do it. Don't. And then... There's the whole terrible thing that goes down with Paula. Thank God it didn't happen. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Many thanks to Megan for commissioning this episode. What's up, Megan? Um, The OG. I, guys, this episode was so full of good moments. This might be my favorite one so far. Um, I, I can't really put my finger on it right now. Why? But by the time I have done with covering this, I might have boiled it down to like, you know, there being one real reason behind it. Um, so the episode starts off with Paula and Rebecca spying on Josh and Valencia moving in together. And Paula makes a reference to Twilight. She calls it the best romance since Shakespeare in love. Which, first of all, have y'all seen Shakespeare in Love? Because I'm not going to lie to you. I cried my eyes out at the end of Shakespeare in Love. Real talk. It wrecked me. I have not seen it for like 10 years, maybe 15 years. So maybe I would feel differently about it now. But at the time, who damn, that shit fucked me up. However, Paula being like, oh, he's your Edward and that's Jacob. Greg is Jacob and you can't and like... You know, where we are now, Jacob just seems so, so preferable to Edward that I can't help but, like, agree that, yes, Josh is the Edward because she shouldn't be with him um, because they are not good for each other. At the same time, this episode sort of ends on a note that makes it seem like maybe they would be better for each other. I don't know maybe I need to rethink that. Greg, on the other hand, is sort of a wild card for me at this point where I feel like I have grown to like him better as a person now that I have gotten to see some of his private life when he's not operating as just that other guy. But I still don't really want her to get with Greg either. So pretty much I don't see either of them as Edward or Jacob because I don't want her with either one is where I'm at. Um, But it's pretty great that like Paula is that huge a Twilight fan and does not believe that Rebecca hasn't like doesn't understand the reference that she's making, which is really fun to me. But yeah, this in this moving in thing, I you guys probably most of you know that I am, that my mother is like very new agey. Um, she's not only a massage therapist, but she's also like taking classes on doing Reiki and is getting a lot more into that. She makes like uh, a lot of different organic body care products and sells those. And she's looking into doing a combo like tarot and astrology service. So a lot of the like hilarious, goofy shit that Valencia talks about is stuff that my mom has said very similar things, but they just managed to make Valencia that extra step silly so that like I can tell, I told my mother yesterday after watching this episode about the line that Valencia says, which is 
I need Sage to get rid of the ghosts. Ghosts are obsessed with me. And my mother cackled for like a minute. So even though she is somebody who 100% believes in ghosts and does believe that Sage gets rid of ghosts, she still found that line really funny because of the ghosts are obsessed with me and the like whole way that it was presented. And that's what I like about this show is that it manages to like, it makes fun of a thing without making that thing specifically the problem. It doesn't make you believing that Sage is a purifying thing into the joke. It makes the girl who thinks that ghosts are here for her because she's that self-centered, the joke. And that's a really like fine line to walk. You know, I just, I'm always really impressed impressed when when shows manage to write a joke that is that could easily be punching down and they sidestep doing that you know like um on community also Britta's character she is a you know kind of bleeding heart liberal and mostly writing making fun of liberals is done by people who don't understand that like the driving force behind being a liberal is really caring about other people and their well-being. And so those jokes often come across as very mean spirited and just kind of like not giving a fuck about human beings. But on community, she is written as very like, like insufferably sanctimonious to the point of like completely uh, eating her own tail and like ruining her own points. And she's just, she's not an easy character to write and, and really be like, Oh my God, they are nailing what's wrong with liberalism. And they do. I'm a liberal and I, well, not really now at this point, I'm friggin' just so far left of liberal, but I just can't like, I can't help but be startled every time when they make fun of liberals and I'm like, yes, oh my God, exactly. Like, that's just really good, insightful writing that only comes when you totally like understand a thing and decide that you're going to take it that extra step further. And I feel like that's part of what really misses the mark for me in a lot of comedies that they make fun of things that the writers clearly don't understand in the first place. So they don't make fun of it in a way that feels like, it's it's coming from a place of love. It's like that's my problem, for example, with Big Bang Theory is that it's written at, like to me and I haven't watched the whole series, but the few episodes I saw felt like a bunch of people who didn't understand nerds or nerd culture making fun of nerds and doing that from the outside without any real understanding of like this meaning things to people for personal reasons and being very wrapped up in their identity in a way that isn't superficial. That's really like part of their like safety net, you know? So anyway, this, this whole thing with how them moving in together is really like uh, tough to watch because she is already talking about marriage and kids. And it's really clear that he's not necessarily on that page with her at all. And it doesn't seem like either of them is paying attention to what the other one is saying when they talk or when they don't talk, as the case may be. And I have seen this relationship and it is startling to me how people do this sort of thing. Um, I don't know if I am less guilty of it because I have always been like really lucky in that it hasn't been hard for me to meet people. It has never been something that I, I have not, for example, found myself so frustrated with dating that I would wind up with somebody that I was just like, oh, well, at least he's not a fucking complete jerk off like these other dudes I dated. So I'll overlook this and that that he said. I haven't been in that position because I'm really, really lucky when it comes to romantic relationships most of the time. So for me, the idea of somebody literally saying to me, which is what happens here, basically, with Josh and Valencia. She's like marriage kids. And he's like, oh, well, I forget what it was that he was talking about. He, I think he says, I was thinking that we were really close to Taco Bell. 
which is played as a joke and it is funny, but it also just is so clearly him sidestepping what she's talking about, admitting that it has not been on his mind in that way. And kind of like it, it, it just betraying a complete lack of compatibility of the way the two of them think. And if I were in Valencia's position and I said something like that, and the guy said that back to me, I couldn't just let that lie there. I would have to be like, and I wouldn't necessarily be angry, but Valencia just sort of moves on with talking about, you know, like the moving in process and needing the sage. And I would be the person that stops and is like, oh, you know, is that not something that you really want? Because like I'm moving in and if you're not interested in that at all, maybe we should talk this out first. Like that's, I am, I'm not somebody who is afraid of having those kinds of conversations at all. In fact, sometimes I have them too much and I wind up taking the mystery and fun out of a relationship because I am too verbal and want to talk things to death. So, and, and the fact that he hears her say marriage and kids and that doesn't spark any sort of interest in him and that he isn't wanting to examine that. I mean, Josh isn't exactly a self-reflective person anyway. So not wanting to examine things is pretty much within his character, you know, but I am surprised that it doesn't alarm him more. Because that's sort of what I would expect if it's, this wasn't on his mind, for her to be talking about stuff that's that serious, for him to be having a bit more of a panicked response when she does bring it up. And he doesn't. Instead, it's just sort of like a, it's like the words roll over him and wash past without really sinking in at all. Um, so anyway, yeah, these two just, you know, the whole, the whole episode deals with the fact that the two of them want really different things and have really different understandings of what this relationship is and what it's supposed to be and what they want from it. And in the end, I'm just going to like talk about this whole subplot right like as one bit here instead of jumping back and forth. He has his friends come over because she tells him that she's worried about the fact that they don't have any furniture. And he goes and buys a table and all of his friends are basically like, you didn't check with her about this before you got it. And Josh doesn't see the problem. And this is part of what kind of bothers me a little bit about Josh. And it's framed in the end as Valencia being really shitty to Josh because she doesn't appreciate all the work that he put into this and, just because she doesn't like it, she's willing to sacrifice his thoughtfulness by just totally disregarding the gift. And don't get me wrong. That was shitty. Like when somebody builds a whole thing for you and makes it clear, they put a ton of effort into it and you just don't like it. That sucks. And maybe just like deal with it and put a fucking tablecloth over it. At the same time though, his friends all seem to know Valencia better than Josh knows Valencia. And it's unclear to me whether or not that's because he just doesn't see her clearly because he is blinded by his attraction to her or if it's because he is willfully ignoring the parts of her personality that he doesn't really like or understand. And it may be a little of column A and B, you know, um, really in the end what it comes down to to me is that his friends tried to explain to him like dude you know she's pretty picky and you probably want to talk through with her and he's so wrapped up in the idea of surprising her without really thinking through who she is as a person and whether or not the thing that he thinks is so thoughtful is actually thoughtful because that's the part that I get really annoyed about when people say well it's the thought that counts is there thought in it though because that's kind of part of the problem is that he's doing this because he thinks it will make her happy because he's only heard, I want a table. And that's as far as his brain has gone. And that's not really what this is about. You know, she wants to build a home with him. And that is, you know, 
part that's her taste should be part of that. He doesn't get to just go out and pick stuff. So as somebody who is also personally pretty picky about stuff, there are things that you can just pick something out for me and it's fine. But a table, which is going to be a, the centerpiece of a room for the most part, that's something that's like, I can't really understand him deciding to take it upon himself. Like he's never met this girl and doesn't know what she's about yet. Like he should be aware this is a bad move if he knows her at all. And if he's moving in with her and doesn't know enough about her to realize what a poor move this is, there is so much that is about to come out about how incompatible the two of them are that we haven't seen yet that I have to wonder what the fuck they've been doing as a couple this entire time. And I said this already that they haven't been like living together from, from the moment that we see Josh again surprises me because they talk about how they've been together like several years and that's a long time to be dating and living in separate places. And even if you aren't living together, this these bits of personality should be obvious by now. So again, his friends seem to know Valencia better than he does, and he doesn't really seem to want to hear what they have to say, even though it's, you know, they don't like her. And they make it clear with their little thing about like how, well, it's not too late to bail on the table. And it's that's Greg that starts that off. And White Josh picks it up and is clearly understanding where Greg is going. And they all basically say, I don't like this girl, but they're using subtext that is apparently too subtextual for Josh to pick up on. Um, we haven't liked this table. It doesn't really go with you. It's not like we just don't, we think that you could get a better table. There are other tables out there. And it's sort of funny to me that they're all saying this and yet they, like, I guess this is how it is in relationships. They all understand her more and thus dislike her more than Josh, who seems blind to parts of her personality. One could call them flaws, but as, again, someone picky, I hesitate to say that being picky is a flaw. I think the way that she dealt with the disappointment is the flaw that she could have been a lot more gracious about it. But at the same time, I, it's a, it's a big piece of furniture that is a centerpiece in a room. He probably spent a few hundred dollars on it and, you know, may as well get something that you actually like. This is one of those terrible things. I always wonder what women do when they get uh, proposed to with a ring that they hate, because I picked this ring. I wanted something that was not a diamond because in my opinion, diamonds are an enormous waste of money. I wanted something that was really distinctive that I had not seen on anybody else. And that really reflected who I am brightly colored and loud and just kind of like, but also like weirdly preppy and classic. So I found this and told Owen, if you ever propose, get this. There are women who are proposed to with rings they never saw in their lives and what, I mean, that's a ring that you have to wear for the rest of your life if you stay married. I mean, I just can't imagine what you do if somebody proposes and it's something you despise, you know, like, what do you, you can't ever really say anything about it, can you? And that's how I feel about this piece of furniture. It's part of why I've told Owen, like, even if you have the money to buy me jewelry as a gift, which is allegedly something like all women want jewelry, don't buy me jewelry. I am so picky. Don't do it. You're wasting your money and you're going to put me in an awkward position where you're going to have spent too much on a thing that I don't necessarily want to wear and then you're going to get your feelings hurt. Just avoid it. There's all kinds of other shit you can get me. Kitchen stuff and like holiday stuff. And I know I'm dwelling on this way too much, guys, but seriously, it's just something that like any women out there, Megan says, I picked my ring too. I can't imagine wearing a ring I hated. Megan, straight up, like shopping for rings together or just giving a guy an idea of the styles you like and him picking it, fine. But I would love to hear from somebody who got a ring that they did not pick out because for some women I could see it's, you know, it's my engagement ring and the symbol of it. 
matters more to me than the way it looks. There are certain women out there who are not caught up in the aesthetic the way that I am. I always point to the room behind me as an example of how obviously like very important it is to me for things to look a certain way. And not everybody's like that. So maybe you get a ring and you don't really love it, but you're just kind of like, well, this is fine. And you're fine with that. Um, and Megan says there's a Reddit post about this. Oh God, Megan, is it about that Amber heart shaped ring? Guys, if oh, there's some woman got proposed to and it's bad. Is bad. Is real bad. It was the kind of thing that when you were reading it before you saw the picture of the ring, you thought maybe this girl was being a little bit ungrateful and overreacting or just being like a bit picky like Valencia. And then you see the ring and you just gasp out loud because it's so hideous that the fact the dude proposed to her with it is really m saying more about him as a person. Like the, the what guy would pick this and be like, here it is. This is perfect. Like it's a giant honking heart-shaped amber ring in like a sterling silver very plain setting and it's awful um but anyway so his friends not liking valencia i feel like is meant to signal that if rebecca continues to make her moves that some of them might be a little bit supportive of it greg definitely not because i feel like he knows how bad this whole situation is but White Josh might be. And then there's Hector. And he has this whole monologue that is so obviously meant to be about pulling out his dick and fucking from ass to pussy, ass to pussy. But instead, it's about him pulling his car out and sometimes having to park in the back and it gets really dirty. And then he has to park in the front lot and he gets the front lot dirty. And guys, it is the most excruciatingly awkward thing in the entire world and I could not I wanted to tear my face off it was so awful and he is so un, like, I don't know as an actor how you get through that monologue without losing your shit like they must have had to do like 12 takes and how you can be in the room with him as he's doing that monologue and not crack up like it's just oh god but yeah, so Valencia in the end tells him, you know, you could just take it apart and send it back. Thanks. And I'm like, as much as it sucks that she asked him to do that, and as much as it's like kind of unreasonable after they made it clear they stayed up all night doing this, it was a bad choice on his part. And I'm not really as mad at Valencia as I feel like the show kind of wants me to be. And then... Josh shows the picture of the table to Rebecca and is like, do you like this table? And she's like, it's a perfect table. Like she just doesn't seem to understand really what's happening here. And like the whole beginning of this episode, once Dr. Phil starts to come into the fucking picture is about how much of a sad, empty place her apartment is. So of course she's going to say it's a perfect table because she doesn't give a fuck about this stuff. And that's valid in its own way. There's nothing wrong with not caring about the aesthetic. But also, I feel like there's a danger in making it seem like people who do care are so high maintenance that that's a bad thing. And we all just prioritize different shit. And that's not wrong. We just learn to live in the way that makes us happy. And there's nothing inherently wrong with it either way. And I would say that the fact that Rebecca has not put any thought into her surroundings is more like worrisome than being picky about what you live with and what your home is like, because it seems like she hasn't tried to there, like to me, making a place homey and pleasant to be in is part of self care. It's part of making yourself happy and feeling like you belong where you are. And the fact that she hasn't done that fits right in with the fact that she doesn't take care of herself at large, you know? Um, so anyway, the table, I just had to talk about it because it just, I had a lot of feelings, obviously. And I, I do like that when he shows it to her, the fact that she doesn't care that about aesthetic enough, she's just like, yeah, it's a perfect table. What it is 
that is one of the few things that has made me think, well, maybe they wouldn't be terrible together. Because as much as I keep looking at their intellects being a huge gulf between the two of them, Rebecca is pretty introspective, even though she's in denial a lot of the time. She's still thinking about things. And she's extremely intelligent and a very like overachiever. And Josh is none of those things. People can be extremely different about the way they approach life. And if they agree on the details, that can be enough. So maybe the fact that she is so easygoing on this because it's not really a priority for her would line up way better with the way that Josh wants to live. I don't know, you know, but I, I appreciate the show giving me something that makes me think that the two of them could be good because really at the moment, she doesn't belong with Josh. She doesn't really belong with Greg. Josh doesn't belong with Valencia. I don't think Josh belongs with Rebecca. There are more people in the world than these four people, you know, like we could do better. Um, but anyway, so Rebecca, for her part, is so fucked up because she is calling Josh while he's having this like move in moment with Valencia and he's fucking busy and she, and he puts her on mute or he ignores her call. And it really messes with her that he ignores her. But like he's with his girlfriend moving in. I just don't see it. Like both her and Paula just take this as the biggest slap in the face. I mean, these people are meant to be around my age, right? Or maybe a little younger. I'm thinking I'm thinking early 30s. So y'all correct me if I'm wrong. But we all just don't answer the phone. Am I wrong about this? Like being ignored when somebody is calling you, that's standard. That is what you should expect from me when you call. I am not going to answer. You will text me and you will explain to me if you need to have a conversation with me, why this cannot be done via text and why we must talk on the phone. And you will prepare me for the fact that you will be calling and I will tell you when I will be available to actually answer because I don't just answer the phone whenever somebody's calling and I'm in the middle of shit. That's insane. That's insane of me to expect that of people this at this time in history with the technology that we have now. This isn't 1985 and she called and he picked up the phone, heard her voice and hung up in his face. This isn't even 1998 where she calls and caller ID shows up and he just walks away from the phone and goes into the living room to fucking look at like watch TV. This is 2000 and what is this? 15 at this point, 14, when we have all these other ways of communicating and I don't need to drop everything to talk to you if it's not a good time for me, which this clearly isn't, but whatever, he ignores her and she completely loses her shit and you know, I really do understand that the ignore isn't really the thing. It's the ignore on top of the fact that he's with Valencia and that they're moving in together and being all lovey-dovey at the time. But nevertheless, the ignore is really like setting her off in a way that I just don't feel is warranted. But we needed something, I guess, to get this rolling. So she goes down this road where she is supposed to be meeting with this new client and really like doing her thing that she does where she is like on top of it and really going to manage her, her like she, she has done this before, right? Where she's been having a bad day in another respect, but she fucking manages to pull it out regarding her career and still do what she needs to do. And she doesn't do that here. First of all, she, is writing an email and writes something about Josh moving in with his girlfriend in the email because she's so distracted and then is like horrified with herself that she actually did that. She pulls a bottle out of her drawer that says, don't drink me, Rebecca. And she pours it into her pen cup, which is full of blue ink because she had a broken pen in there and doesn't realize it. And goes out 
to meet this client and she had this like moment before where she, Dr. Phil pops up on her computer and it's really sort of, uh, up in the air, whether or not this specific like bit here where her, with her seeing this video is part of her imagination or if it's actually online, but I think it's meant to be actually online. Um, and he is describing the symptoms of a panic attack. Um, Ashley, oh, Ashley says, I think it's the act of him pulling out the phone, seeing who it is, and then ignoring the call. He made a conscious decision to ignore the call just because it was her. At least that's how I saw it or would see it. See, Ashley, I wouldn't, like, this is me just so not taking that shit personally. I have had Owen call me and ignore it. I love him to death, and I would die for him. And I have ignored his call plenty of times because it's a bad time. And, like, to me, her decision to call him when he's in the middle of hugging up and kissing up on the girl he's moving in with in front of a truck full of boxes that they're moving into this new place. To me, that is the epitome of rudeness, her choosing to call at that moment. And she deserves whatever response she gets because he's she's purposely trying to interrupt a moment between the two of them. And she's acting like all she needs to do is insert herself and that's going to be the magical thing that like breaks the two of them up. And it's like, as Phil puts it later, you have made yourself available. He knows where you are. If he wanted to find you, he could. She doesn't like, that's to, to me, that's like me being on the air and a friend being in the audience right now and wanting to call me while I'm fucking talking to y'all and then being mad that I didn't take their call while I'm recording. You know, just like, why would you expect me to? And, and like, would you, if you were Valencia in that moment and Josh decided to take a call, how would you feel about that? You'd be disgusted, you know? So yeah, no, I can't. And, and besides like her being like, oh, it's just, he specifically ignored me. I really believe anybody who called at that moment, he wouldn't answer the phone. I don't think if his mom called, he would answer it either. This is just not a good time. Um, but knowing that she is literally sitting in a car down the block watching them and calling because of the reasons that she is makes it even worse that she gets as offended as she does. But anyway, so she go she has to go and meet with this client. And this is the first time that we see him. It is quite a fucking entrance. So I can't remember the name of this guy. Is it Leroy? Um, but he walks in and there's a real sort of a, uh, like, it's a weird moment. Calvin. Thank you, Megan. So Calvin is treated in this moment as if he's really like drawn the eye of the ladies in the office. There's a slow-mo entrance. He's adjusting his suit, brushing his shoulders off kind of thing. Guys, is it just me or is Calvin like really not attractive at all? I just, I, the moment that he walked in, my first instinct was like, bug eyes. Oh, God. This man has some bug eyes. And those eyes are bloodshot and look unhealthy. He needs to get some sleep, get some eye drops, hydrate. I don't know what, but he doesn't look healthy to me. And all of these women that are supposedly sort of falling on themselves, I didn't get it. Like, it was a, I guess, supposed to be just like that that sort of campy thing where we me are meant to believe that in this world he is somebody. But my immediate reaction of, oh, God, to his face when the, the doors of the elevator part, followed by this reaction from all the women on the show, was straight baffling to me. Like, I had a moment of just like, wait, am I? Oh, I guess we're supposed to... Okay. Like I had to completely shelve my own personal reaction and just pretend that I bought what the show was selling at this point. And I'm not trying to be mean, but like, I'm just saying that if you don't buy into this right out of the gate, it's a weird adjustment to have to make throughout the episode and pretend that you see this guy as being really suave when you know, and, and I know part of the joke is that he's like suave for an ordinary guy. Like there really isn't anything about him that is genuinely so much head and shoulders above 
most men, but he is head and shoulders above the yahoos that these people work with and see all day. So I get that that's part of the joke is like how little you have to do to attract attention when everybody's used to a bunch of mediocrity. But yeah, I'm just, you know, that moment was weird. And he comes in and he sees Paula and she is in the middle of trying to tell her husband that he needs to do the carpool and he is arguing with her about it. And she hangs up on him, basically. And it's one of those moments that I really like know so many women that go through this or have gone through this of a man just totally not holding up his end of the shit that these women have to deal with all the time. Have you guys ever seen there was a, a Reddit post a while back and this guy got dunked on so bad and it was very satisfying. Um, and I think it was an am I the asshole post, which those it's amazing. Most of the am I the asshole posts on Reddit that are done by men, they are indeed the asshole. And most of the ones that are done by women, they are absolutely not the asshole and nobody in their right mind would ever say that they were. And it tends to just kind of fall that way because we're trained to not really trust our own judgment and men are trained to believe that they are the center of the universe a lot of the time. And this guy was arguing with his wife about which one of them carried the most weight in the household in terms of doing the most to keep it running. And he was being really condescending and shitty to her and told her that he really didn't see what the big deal was about what she did and handled in the house. And she made a bet with him that he should do everything that she does all the time for one week. And if he couldn't manage it, that like she, I can't even remember what it was that was supposed to be like the payoff at the end. But long story short, that motherfucker got through a day and a half and started to completely lose it because shocker, he had no fucking concept of what she dealt with as somebody who worked and took care of three children and a husband who apparently never lifted a fucking finger for himself and was totally shocked at how much work it was to do all of the laundry and make sure everybody had the clothes that they needed for soccer practice and for school and for school pictures to make dinner every day and wash the dishes and make sure that you had dishware enough so that you could make dinner the next day and plan out what you had to buy at the grocery store. And then actually like all of that stuff, it was only a day and a half. And he was on Reddit complaining because his wife refused to take her side of things again. He did yard work and, and like taking care of the car and thought that that was comparable to all of the household stuff she did. And then when he realized he was wrong, he wanted her to take back some of the stuff and help him. And when she refused, as she was right to do, because she's a fucking queen, and told him, no, we agreed to a week. You're doing a week. Sorry. I told you, I tried to warn you. I've been asking for your help and you've been totally like ducking me. He came on Reddit to complain to everybody and say, so don't you all think that she should be agreeing to help me now that I realized my mistake and apologize to her? And everybody in the comments was like, no, you guys have been married for how many years? Seven. And she's been doing all of this the entire fucking time. And now she wants a week off and you are coming out here whining to all of us about it get fucked, dude. It was the best. And I really kind of want that to happen for Paula. Because she talks about how her marriage is the walking dead at the beginning of this episode. And every time we have seen him, it has been the worst. I hate him. I hate him so much. And it's really ironic to me that a lot of the like jokes about like, especially like 90s and 80s couples jokes about how, oh, my wife never wants to fuck anymore. As I get older, and I start to meet more women that are married and have been married for a while, the most common complaint is that they want sex and their husband doesn't. So there's always been this stereotype that you get married and sex life dies out. But it seems like guys are actually like projecting that and that women are the ones that want sex and aren't getting it in the majority of like relationships that I have seen and talked with people about. So she's like talking to um, 
Rebecca at the end and says like, you know, I haven't had, se- I haven't made love without the TV on in like, I think she says four years, something like that. And that he hasn't held her hand in 10 years. This is the stuff that it's really easy when people talk about like marriage is work. People think about it as like, you know, the work of continuing to create a life together because of like, you know, just generally like providing, but they don't think about this stuff, which is what I think it means. And it, that is appreciating one another and not taking each other for granted and taking each other for granted happens without you noticing that it's happening. Every time that you're like, I would, I'd like to hang out with him, but he'll be there. I'll just stay on my phone a little bit longer. Those are the moments that you really have to watch yourself because I had a marriage that fell apart because we completely started to take one another for granted. And it is the loneliest thing in the entire world. I really felt for Paula in this episode because it's not like, I am not somebody who just across the board is just like cheating is wrong and always wrong and whatever. I think that cheating is usually a bad move. But I also really understand a lot of the reasons why some people want to do it. There are some people who are just serial cheaters and they're just selfish and terrible. But Paula's situation feels so similar to the situation that I was in when I met Owen that it's really hard for me to watch because I feel like I got lucky in that I wound up getting out of that relationship without ever actually having cheated on my husband. We had decided that we were divorcing long before I actually met Owen in person. But nevertheless, this feeling was there. There was a temptation for me to meet somebody else, like to go out and search for somebody else, because I felt completely alone all the time and totally unappreciated all the time. And there is nothing quite as heartbreaking as looking at somebody and knowing that they are not even like aware of you and that 10 years earlier, this is not how it was between the two of you, you know, and how just watching a relationship change and watching somebody that you were crazy about and whom you also trusted so completely to like always see you watching that go away Or coming to the realization that maybe it wasn't actually ever there the way that you thought it was, is one of the worst things to go through in the entire world. So I was in the Facebook page for the uh, group, the patrons group, and I was saying like, don't, don't do it. Don't do it, Paula. Not because I felt like she should be loyal to her husband. But because of what Rebecca says, which is it's a Band-Aid, I understand why she wants to do it. I understand what about this guy is appealing to her in her present frame of mind right now. But it is going to be the wrong thing. I should have, in my case, simply left Brendan when I realized I felt like this. When I realized I'm alone. I'm sitting next to you on the couch and I'm alone. And... I should have just ended things cleanly there, but I didn't do that partially because I like sort of hoped that maybe we could save it despite what my gut was telling me. And partially because leaving somebody is an enormous frightening step. And I was not in a position financially to do that. And I wanted to bide my time and make it easier on myself. I was being really selfish about it. And I could have saved us both a lot of heartache if I had just finished things. But instead, I decided to like, hang on to it in one way, while still reaching for something else, and then caused this like, like, break, where I could point to that as being the trigger for us splitting up. But it certainly wasn't the cause of it. Our marriage was over long before. And that's what I kind of hope Paula does here because she seems to really hear it when Rebecca says to her, you have to face that your marriage is dead. 
And I hope Paula really does that. I don't really expect her to, if I'm being honest, because a marriage that has lasted as long as hers has, and she has two kids that are high school age, it is a really tricky thing to break people apart at that point. Like, my parents waited to break up until after I was out of high school. And I understand why they did that. I hope she does it anyway. But if she comes up with a lot of rationalizations as to why it's not the right time, I'm going to get it. I'm going to understand it. It'll be frustrating and I'll feel like she's making the wrong move. But I won't be able to help but understand. And it's just, you know, the whole thing with Paula, I really love that as much as she's this like side character, she still has her own whole deal going on. I love that the show has given both her and Greg this complete like story that feels very relatable and real, you know? Um, and she gets that amazing song about how he, his status is preferred and it is hilarious. The whole thing with him seducing her is just so uncomfortable because he's so whatever, like he's just so not really impressive, but her status, her standards right now are just so low that anybody who literally pays attention and listens to her, that's all she fucking needs. And that's the part that I think guys don't understand when women cheat. If it's like, I won't, won't say when women cheat because people cheat for all different reasons. But I feel like look at what it was that drew them to the person. And is it just that they fucking had a conversation and cared about what the other person said and like saw them as a human being and not just like an appendage of your life? Maybe that's why things aren't working out between you two because you're not doing that. Um, it's just really awkward. The moments where he's like, you know, asking her to cut and, and he tries to pretend that he's like inviting her and her husband. It's a real like sly move that people do. I've seen it. I've had it done to me where, you know, she winds up going by herself and everybody knows what this is. He, his a hotel room. He's all like ready for her. Um, but in the end, when Rebecca busts in, he starts crying too and says that he misses his wife. And I honestly was kind of moved by that. Like it's a shitty move to come in and try and like get people to cheat. And don't get me wrong. The person, the third party is not the responsible one. The person who's married, it is their responsibility to not do this. But he knows that she's married and he's still pursuing her as if she were single and that feels pretty shitty to me. And it sort of makes sense once he says how much he misses his wife, that he's pursuing like a sort of fantasy of a replacement that he doesn't actually have to commit to and ever really compare to his wife. And so I kind of liked that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that whole thing was just so good. And, and her song for that is so hilarious. And I just... I loved it. I, and she's just got such a good voice. It's actually her singing, I'm pretty sure, right? And her voice is just so good. I love her. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking about him doing the, the sexy gonna do it song, and it's terrible. But okay, so let's back up and go to Rebecca, because Rebecca is fucking breaking down. Um, she winds up getting sent home early from work because she just completely loses it. She's in there with like blue ink on her teeth as she's talking. She smells like vodka. She's getting the fucking name of a firm wrong. Like it is really bad. And she gets sent home early and she is hallucinating Dr. Phil being there, being very impatient with her and giving her advice and what I love about this is the suggestion that because this is all coming from her own head, what's being implied here is that she knows all this already, that she's smart enough to realize this all about herself, but then shoes it away. And that's something that I think a lot of us can relate to. Oh my God, are human beings good at denial? It is crazy town banana pants, how malleable our fucking brains are that we can get ourselves to believe anything. It is really scary, to be honest. And the fact that she can just 
have somebody in her head literally telling her, you really need to get your shit together and don't take that drug. And what are you doing? This is a Band-Aid. You're not fixing things. Like, relatable, hardcore relatable. And she winds up going to a therapist because she's convinced that if she just gets drugged, that she will be able to manage and go back to work and be herself. And the therapist is rightfully like horrified when she sees the list of prescriptions that Rebecca was taking when she was in New York. She calls her doctor a quack and is like, you had to, you couldn't have felt a thing. And she says, Oh yeah, no, I was, I was as numb as they come. So are you going to give it to me or not? And this woman is like, no, why would I fucking do that? Are you kidding me? We need to get the root of the problem here. This is not going to help you. And Rebecca doesn't want to hear it. And she leaves. She goes to the bathroom. She finds a random ADD pill on the floor of the bathroom and decides to take it because that's a great idea. And I was really surprised, to be honest, because she decides to take it while she's home for the weekend instead of saving it for when she has to be at work, which I kind of expected her to do. But no, she um, she takes it, does all of this like awful decorating in her house with Christmas lights and stuff, like it's no good and really feels like she's proven her point to the Dr. Phil ghost that this is what she needs. Meanwhile, that specter is looking at her like, are you fucking kidding me? And then she realizes that she's maybe a little too high and needs to come down. So she finds her uh, pothead neighbor and smokes weed with her. And then gets the bright idea that she should maybe try and steal the prescription pad from the therapist that she was seeing, the psychiatrist. So she, long story short, gets caught trying to sneak in the doggy door of the psychiatrist's place. I don't know if it's her office or her house. I get the impression it's her house. Um, can we talk real quick about the fucking bunny wallpaper in the psychiatrist's bathroom because that's really unnerving and I did not like that at all. Um, but she gets caught and the psychiatrist makes a deal with her that if she'll start actually coming to sessions and properly trying to figure out her problems, that she will not press charges against Rebecca who was trying to break and enter. Rebecca agrees to this just to keep from getting pr charges pressed clearly just not really thinking through whether or not this is like valid and starts to sort of pass out on the front lawn and her neighbor, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Megan says, I think they were going for an Alice in Wonderland thing with the wallpaper and pill and vodka. That's that's pretty good, Megan. I like that idea. Huh. Interesting. Drink me. Don't drink me. I like it. I didn't think of that. Um, but she is on the front lawn and she has, uh, I can't remember her neighbor's name, Heather. Oh, thank you, Megan. Um, give her her phone because she is going to call in for the following day and tell, you know, she wants to tell Paula that she's not going to be able to do the presentation and can Paula manage it for her. And Paula picks up and is being real weird and says something about how she's in the hotel room. And immediately Rebecca sits up and is like, wait, what? And Paula then is like, he's here. I got to go and hangs up. And Rebecca fucking is not here for it. Like, I don't know in the end how she figures out which room they're in because they are not allowed to say at the front desk, which room somebody's in, but we'll just pretend that she like knew. And I love it. How, when it comes to her own shit, Rebecca is a disaster, but when it comes to making sure her friends don't fuck their lives up, that's when she can pull her shit together. And I feel like that's just so real for so many of us, you know, it's just a lot easier to see problems from the outside and clearly like be able to define what the patterns are that are happening. But when it's you, your patterns, you find excuses for why those patterns don't really count. You know, it's, oh, well, I'm the exception because of such and such. I know it looks like this, but if you knew him, you'd realize that wasn't really any time you catch yourself saying shit like that is when you are textbook the thing you are pretending you are not. And Rebecca just 
seems to sober up almost immediately and fucking heads over there with this head of steam built up and confronts Paula and is like, this is a Band-Aid. You are using him as a means of escaping the fact that your marriage is over. And I'm doing the same thing by trying to get drugs instead of addressing why I'm depressed, why I'm here, why I'm like, you know, why my life is the way that it is. And both of us are just trying to come up with ways to avoid looking at the larger, harder picture fucking true. I mean, you know, so much of our lives are spent as distractions from the things that really matter because the things that really matter are so overwhelmingly important that we are terrified at the idea of fucking them up and just would rather not deal with it at all, which in the end fucks them up anyway, but we never really think far enough ahead to acknowledge that part, you know? So Paula realizes that she's right. And, uh, and Calvin also realizes that they are right. Meanwhile, Heather's over in the background, still stoned off her ass, just watching and saying how entertaining it all is. And I was just like, Heather, girl, you you need to have a realization. Some We can't have three out of four having it. We need all four. But she doesn't, sadly. Um, and I have skipped over the sexy French depression. I think somebody in the group shared the version of the song that had the subtitles because there are long stretches where Rebecca is speaking in French and they don't translate it on Netflix. So I haven't watched it yet. Um, but I did notice that they weren't translating it and I found it weird. Um, so I'm going to have to check that out, but I really did enjoy that song. I thought that the, like, I just really love all of the details in the, in the musical moments where they just have these visual jokes that are really well done. And, uh, you know, the whole, the, the depiction of depression, there's a line in it where she says that her bed smells like a tampon. Oh, guys, that is foul. That is bad. Like I have had pretty severe bouts of depression. I would say that I've probably stank. I'm, I'm really lucky in that I don't like have BO and stuff. I'm really like, I mentioned that to Owen and he had stopped and looked at me and was like, you're right. You don't, I never thought of it, but no, you don't. Um, but this is so far past BO when you like, Oh God, guys, I had like a visceral reaction to that line in the song. Oh no, I don't think I've ever quite gotten to that point. Um, at the very least, if there's a blanket that I keep using that starts to stink, I'll just at least throw it in the dryer with like a dryer sheet, you know. Um, but I really appreciate them showing the depression with just, you know, how how much you can see from the outside in in a way how bad it is, but you are powerless to really do anything about it. That's what's so frightening and upsetting about depression is it feels like you are out of control of yourself. And it's just, it's an awful feeling to sort of be aware, but helpless, you know? Um, eh, yeah, it's like trying to climb up out of a well where you know where you are and you know you should be up there, but there's just nothing to be done and you kind of have to wait it out and hope that it gets better and find like something significant enough to get you out of there. And oftentimes for many of us, we don't find that thing. It just passes and we get back to normal and wait for it to inevitably come upon us again. Like in some ways it's better for Rebecca that her, this like bout of depression was brought on by something very specific because it is something that she can sort of pinpoint. And I feel like that's comforting in a way, but it might not really change in the end 
the fact that it's there, you know, who knows? But anyway, so yeah, the episode ends with that sexy gonna do it song. And it is just so... Oh, God, guys, Calvin, no. There are so many awkward, terrible moments of Calvin, like, being, quote, impressive. He says something about, like, trying an Arizona wine with a camembert. And I was just like, mm, guy, Arizona wine, are you doing this? And then when he's fucking scatting at the jazz club, doobity beep bop boop boop. Oh, no, y'all. Mm-mm. No, sorry, Bob. I am not here for scatting. Nah. And she's like trying to scat with him. Way to make it worse, Paula. I already thought this was as bad as it was going to get, but it wasn't until you started to scat with him that it just got like peak terrible. <sighs> um, but yeah, this I really like this episode. This was fun. So thank you, Megan, for commissioning it and for helping me out with names in the uh, chat. And thank you, Ashley, also for joining me in the chat. Um, there is another episode coming up next week. So stay tuned for that, everybody. And until then... Doodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.
was an unspoiled network podcast.